got something for you today. And there's just one thing that I want to say. everything new Jesus one day you will bind every wound the former things shall all pass away no more tears one day you'll make sense of it all Jesus one day every question resolved Just all left behind, no more fear. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll see. Shout the victory. 
will see face to face. Jesus, is there a greater nation of grace? And in a moment we shall be changed on that day. And one day we will be free indeed. Jesus, one day all the struggle will see. see your glory revealed on that day. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Triangle Grace, those present in person, those who are uh, with us through the wonder of the internet and streaming. I want to wish you a wonderful, happy Thanksgiving week as you prepare to gather together with friends and family and pray that that would be blessed travels and a blessed fellowship as you uh, see friends and those you love. And we, we actually had a wonderful time just a few days ago uh, at our pre-Thanksgiving meal, Diane and Penny and Sue and others who had gathered to help prepare a wonderful meal for our church family. And just want to thank you again for that, uh, that really meaningful time of fellowship and delicious food together. And, and as you know, we then are right after Thanksgiving turning towards the season of Advent. And uh, 
there are a lot of ways and opportunities uh, that you can be involved. Uh, you'll see out in the narthex uh, a small tree that has a promotion about the Gideons and providing Bibles to those who may not have Bibles. You can sponsor purchase of one or more uh, there. Uh, if you came in the back of the church, you'll see a number of opportunities to give and to be involved. There's the angel tree that provides gifts for uh, children. Uh, there's Operation Christmas Child that gets sent across uh, the world. You'll uh, see uh, other things there too. Uh, the Fayetteville School is still there. There's information about giving to that school and helping those in need uh, within our city. Uh, there's children's Advent material uh, at that same location at the back of our church. I uh, encourage you to pick those up and involve your family and in the four weeks uh, of Advent as we prepare for celebrating the birth of Christ. Uh, there's poinsettias that you can uh, order to help decorate our sanctuary during that season, uh, dedicate it to someone you love, and you can find out all this information on our website through our newsletters that are sent out uh, through the internet. I was reminded this morning that uh, today actually is Christ the King Day. If you have liturgical sensitivities and know the, uh, the liturgical calendar, uh, this is actually the last Sunday of uh, the liturgical calendar before it all starts again, uh, which begins with Advent. And so we celebrate on the last day of the liturgical calendar Christ as King, Lord over everything, before we then go through the process of worshiping him through the year, through each of those special days of recognition. Uh, so with that in mind, let's uh, come before a king and worship him. Uh, let me offer Psalms 116 as a call to worship to us this morning. Here's what the psalmist writes. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you, O Lord, and call on the name of the Most High. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Let's join our hearts together as we pray. Indeed, King Lord Jesus, we come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts, even as we enter into this week of national thanksgiving, uh, and we do so lifting your name high. We pray that during this time of worship, that you will be honored and glorified through everything that happens in this place as we seek to lift high your name, King of kings and Lord of lords. So receive the worship that we bring, and we'll offer it to you in your precious name. Amen. Hope that you were listening to the praise team as they were uh, beginning. Uh, we're going to sing what they were singing, and if you're able, I'll invite you to stand as we enter into worship one day when we all get to heaven. Sing and shout the victory. 
our faith as we use the historic words of the Apostles' Creed, which you'll find printed in your bulletin. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. As we come to God in worship, we recognize that we come as flawed people. Scripture tells us that there's none righteous, no, not even one. We've all fallen short of God's glory, but we come with hope. We come with expectation because we come to a God who loves us and who has promised to forgive us. Let's confess our sins before our loving God as we pray the prayer of confession you'll find printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Father in heaven, 
you have bid us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yet we confess we do not seek out your kingdom first before all things. We too often desire for our own will to be done rather than yours. We believe it best to trust in our own wisdom and power and strength rather than the wisdom of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the strength that is birthed through faith. Reorient our hearts and minds this day that our greatest longing is to hear you one day say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. This day we confess to you our sin. name of Christ we pray. Amen. Scripture tells us if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friends, that's done through the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who took our sin upon himself and gave to us his own righteousness. Friends, on behalf of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can hear this good news in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. disciples to come up and join Pastor Chris. Well, good morning. Good to see you. Uh, I think I've told you before, and you probably realize this already, that we're new to North Carolina, and we just moved here a couple of months ago, and and uh, we've just been unpacking, just you know, cardboard boxes, pulling stuff apart, and we have almost every single room of our house looking pretty good. In fact, we've invited some people from the church over for dinners and stuff like that. And uh, almost every single room except for one room. Do, do you know what room? No, not the basement. We got, you know, got the basement a little bit together, Tabitha. But there's one room that we just have not been able to put together yet. And it's actually our screen house. There's like a room, a screen room right off of our kitchen. It, it's actually a room that I think is going to be our favorite place to hang out because it's sort of outside but inside and keeps the bugs away and the breeze is blowing through. And I cannot wait to get this room like set up. Do you know why we haven't set it up yet? Because we have ordered patio furniture, you know, like kind of stuff that can be outside to, to furnish the whole room. And I ordered it like three months ago, and it still isn't here. I, I cannot believe how long it is taking for this furniture to get to our house. And, you know, we're like cleaning up, sweeping the area, to wipe down. The house. I have some lights that I'm actually going to hang up in this room, but I, we can't really use it until this furniture. So I keep sending notes to the people I bought it from saying, hey, where's our furniture? And they keep replying, well, it's an estimated date of delivery. <laughs> so I, I think it's probably stuck somewhere in the Pacific Ocean uh, on a ship. Um, but, but I cannot tell you how much I, uh, I'm looking forward to this room where I can hang out with friends and we can be outside and and when that furniture comes, it's going to look awesome. Well, I'm telling you this because 
we're about to study a parable uh, with those who are going to stay in the sanctuary in a moment where Jesus kind of says the same kind of thing, like, hey, I'm going to come here to this earth again, because, you know, he was here as a baby. We're about to celebrate that Christmas, and he grew up, and he lived among us, and he died and resurrected. Then he went to heaven, and he promises that he's coming back. But we have no idea when he's coming back. And I can't wait until he comes back. Because when he comes back, like everything is going to be made right in this world. People who are sad aren't going to be sad anymore. Uh, the, we'll be in his presence. We'll actually get to see God face to face like we sang a, a, a minute ago. It, it's going to be great. But we don't know when it's going to happen. And so in the parable we're going to look at, Jesus just says, hey, look. You, you gotta gotta be ready because it could be any time. Don't doubt. Hold fast. It's going to come. Well, I hope my patio furniture comes. <laughs> uh, I'm trusting the guys who keep telling me that it's going to come. And when it comes, I'll tell you. Uh, next next children's sermon. When, after it comes, I'll say, "Hey, patio furniture's here." Uh, but we can be sure that Jesus is coming back, and we should look forward to it. And while we're waiting until he comes back, well, just like we were, I cleaned the patio up, getting it ready for the furniture, well, we should be doing the same thing now, like helping this world be a better place and telling others about Jesus until he comes back. That's what he's calling us to do today as his servants. Well, you might talk more with Miss Nancy about that in a moment, uh, or if you're staying in the sanctuary, you'll get to hear me talk a little bit more about that, but let's pray for a moment. Lord, we look forward to your return. We don't know when it's going to happen, but sh we sure do want to see you face to face, and we trust when you come, everything's going to be so much better. And so we pray, Lord, come, and until then, we pray that you'd help us to do our best to take care of the sanctuary take care of our homes, take care of uh, everything that you've entrusted to us, and most importantly, take care of people who might not know you. Uh, help us to share with them our hope in your return. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for hanging out, and uh, again, if you're going out with Miss Nancy, have a great time, and otherwise, head hang out with your moms and dads. And as they head out, why don't we use a little time just to go before the Lord and uh, pray uh, to him as a people of God. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful to you for what you have promised to us, uh, that indeed one day you will come, that you will make all things new, that you will wipe away every tear from every eye and every cheek that has been stained. Lord, that you will bring life, life everlasting. You will bring joy and peace. And, oh, Lord, we pray, Maranatha, come. But, Lord, uh, we ask that by your spirit you would empower us to be patient and wait for that day. And in turn, that our energies might be placed uh, into active obedience to care for those that you've entrusted to us for care of those within this congregation lord we pray for those who are sick who are walking through difficult things with their family or children or parents lord we pray that you would come beside those we love within this congregation and minister uh, intimately to them by your spirit. Strengthen them, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would work in each of these instances to draw uh, those who love you into a deeper relationship with you and that you in some way would bring out about a great testimony of your work and provision in their lives. 
Lord, we pray for those outside of this congregation that you've entrusted to us. Uh, those on our streets and in our schools and those that we walk side by side at work. And we ask that you would give us the word of life and, and the opportunity to share it. Lord, we might speak hope to those who have none. Lord, that we might speak peace into situations where there's tension and strife. And Lord, too, we pray for our nation. We pray for our uh, leaders uh, in uh, Raleigh and uh, in Washington and other parts of this nation, that they would be aware and obedient to your will, that their decisions might reflect goodness and righteousness and justice. Lord, we pray for our world as well. Pray for the tensions that are flaring uh, throughout Europe and really throughout the world for over COVID, over uh, national sovereignties, over uh, immigration, over the many issues that have caused hardship and strife in the lives, uh, lives of many. Lord, would you be the Prince of Peace Send your people to places where they can speak peace and hope and bring about reconciliation uh, with you, Lord, and with one another. Lord, we ask that we might be your servants ready for your return, preparing this household and beyond uh, in a way that would please you when you, again, knock on the door and open and stand before us. Uh, Lord, we as we continue to wait for that day, we, as we do each week, pray with great fervency that your kingdom would come and that your will be done. We pray as your son has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our coming and deliver us from evil. It is not good to you, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, again, I do want to wish you a very happy Thanksgiving from both Laura and me. And I'm excited that Advent is just around the corner, ready to launch. Because the Perkins are always all in for the holidays. Uh, we had over a thousand orange and white twinkle lights decorating our bushes and trees to welcome trick-or-treaters last month. And uh, we can't wait to decorate our home in a week or two from uh, floor to ceiling with Christmas decorations. At Thanksgiving, we often would have one of those large blow-up turkeys. Uh, and it actually lit up at night that we would put on our front lawn leading up to Thanksgiving. And uh, always would dress in you know, thematic colors for Thanksgiving Day, oranges and golds and reds. And uh, in fact, a couple of years ago, Tabitha uh, woke up and came out of her room grumpy uh, and, and said, I, you know, I can't find anything that would really reflect Thanksgiving this year. But then she went back into her room and dug some more in her closet and she came out with a big smile on her face and uh, she was wearing this plain pink blouse and she said, look mom, I'm a naked turkey. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, uh, let's, let's turn to our parable uh, for today uh, and note an aspect of our life in which we should give great thanks to the Lord, the assurance of his return and all the implications of that, all the realities and all the promises that he's extended to us for our lives. So we're in Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 40. Luke chapter 12, 35 to 40. Here's what Jesus says. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. And if he comes in the second watch or in the third watch and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. So you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The word of the Lord. Let's pray, Lord. We, uh, we are deeply grateful for your word, the gift that it is to us, and the way that it speaks hope and life into our lives. We ask that we might be shaped by it as we reflect upon this parable this day. Lord, uh, we lay ourselves before you and ask that you, would be a, do, that you would do a transforming work in our heart by your spirit. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you came uh, a, a few weeks ago when I last preached, you will recognize that this parable comes right on the heels of the parable we spoke about that day, the rich uh, fool. And in between these two parables... Jesus contrasts his worldview against those who uh, don't believe in the Lord or don't understand his provision and protection in their lives, like the rich fool that he had just spoken about. He says in verse 22 that those who trust God need not be anxious in life, that uh, if they seek his kingdom, he's going to meet all their needs so they can rest and and enjoy life rather than being anxious and fearful about it. And Jesus then goes and, and says that, well, those who don't know the Lord, they're compelled towards anxiety and fear of life because 
they don't believe there is a God. Uh, the only person they can trust and depend upon for life and protection and provision is just themselves. Uh, there's no one else in the world but them. So Jesus goes on in our parable uh, you know, today driving home the certainty of this future, uh, that there's really good news uh, because the master is going to return. He's going to come home. Uh, we don't know when, but you can be 100% assured that Christ is returning is really the theme of the entire parable. We are to take great heart in life that Jesus will bring about all that he's promised, that the new heavens and earth that he said he will restore and bring about, that our tears will be wiped away, that death and mourning will flee. Everything he's promised in association to his kingdom, uh, it's all going to come about. So he says, be encouraged, be ready, be excited. Stand on your tippy toes waiting for his return. Keep the lamps burning. Extend great care to that which he's entrusted to us uh, until he returns. But as Jesus noted, there were those in his day as well as in our day that actually don't hold to such a worldview as this. Uh, a modern day example is, is Steven Pinker. You uh, may have heard of him. If you watch CNN, he'll pop up there during roundtables and interviews quite often. He's a well-known professor from Harvard University. Uh, he's actually the honorary president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. He's been named at times uh, most 100 most influential people in the world today. And, and Forbes is most uh, 100 most um, influential thinkers of the day. Well, last year he caused quite a stir across social media when he sent out a tweet that said, belief in an afterlife is a malignant delusion. Since it devalues actual life, lives and discourages action that would make them longer and safer and happier. And just for context, he wrote that uh, in response to the desire of a number of churches to want to gather for worship during uh, the outbreak of the pandemic as, as that unfolded last year. And he thought that was irresponsible of them, tying it to the belief that they think, well, you can do whatever you want because, you know, you're going to live forever. And so... And looking back, we have to say, I'd have to say that that's a pretty strong, sweeping indictment against people of faith. As we know, most churches actually heeded the Council of Government officials and medical community and took a very conservative approach to masking and to social gathering and uh, distancing and, and all those issues. In fact, we're still wearing masks today uh, in in respect of the counsel we've received from the leadership in Durham. Uh, and, and we've done all this in you know, as appropriately uh, tangible concerns that we have in our nation and locally about COVID-19. But to tell you the truth, Pinker would have been comfortable writing this statement, sending this tweet out, whether the pandemic happened uh, or not. Uh, because he believes that Christianity has been one of the greatest hindrances to the progress of humanity. And he made three bold assertions in his tweet. First, he says that the afterlife is a delusion. Secondly, he says it's not just a delusion, it's a malignant delusion because it discourage, uh, because it devalues actual life, lives. It devalues actual lives. And third, he says that it's a malignant delusion because it discourages actions that would make lives longer, safer, and happier. 
And we really should be thankful for thought leaders like Steven Pinker, who clearly lay out the distinctions uh, between the worldview of secular humanists and Christians. And we should be intellectually honest that if Pinker's presuppositions are true and accurate, then his logic is solid. His conclusions are, are founded uh, in, in an intellectually logical uh, and consistent manner. But what are his presuppositions? His presupposition, you know, his, he's an atheist. And so his primary presupposition is that there is no God. And if there's no God, then there's no afterlife. And so any talk of an afterlife is a delusion. Pinker's second presupposition is that reason is the fundamental engine of the progress of humanity. So since it's unreasonable to hold to the belief of uh, the existence of God, such belief hinders progress and inevitably becomes a malignancy to which a scalpel should be wielded to cut it free from the body of humanity. So what do you think of Pinker's presuppositions? Well, I would say Christians equally hold reason in high regard and we actually believe our logic and worldview is sound and consistent. It's logically based on our presuppositions. We disagree with Pinker, and we believe as our primary presupposition that there is a God. And though, the, though we hold human reason in uh, high regard like Pinker, we believe that the wisdom of God is superior to ours, that Human progress is primarily dependent on the wisdom and the work of God and our obedience to his counsel. And so contrary to Pinker, we believe that our beliefs or our presupposition that there is a God brings actual value to people's lives, that, uh, that they encourage action. This, these presuppositions we hold encourage actions which make people's lives longer and safer and happier. And that's the kind of presupposition, that's the kind of worldview that is pulsing through chapter 12 of Luke. Uh, this parable we read a moment ago, stay dressed, keep your lamps burning, blessed are the servants uh, whom the master finds awake uh, when he comes, Jesus says. If you were to translate that into the language of social science that Pinker uh, walks in, it would be something like, accept with your mind and your heart the reasonable presupposition that there is a good and just God and orient your life around that presupposition and Positive progress will come for uh, will be made for you and others. I actually like the language of uh, burning lamps and and blessings and servants and all that kind of stuff better than that. But Jesus uh, says in verse forty, "Be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect," and that is a complete contradiction to Pinker's view about progress and about the afterlife. Because you probably know that uh, when Jesus makes the same statement in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, that statement about this, be ready, the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect, it, it's connected to a very long discourse about the end times and about uh, the afterlife. And contrary to Pinker's view that reason alone serves as the primary engine of uh, human progress. In Matthew 24, Jesus describes a future in which there is an increase of war and rumors of war. Where nations rise up against nations. Where famine 
and disease get the best of human ingenuity. Jesus talks about a coming time because of the bent reasoning of man where lawlessness will increase and the love of many grows cold and it will be Christ who will come back to set things right. It's not brought about by the rational work of human invention or humanist ideals. And so we're confronted with two distinct worldviews, one of the secular humanist and the other of the Christian atheist. I'm sorry. Let me do that whole sentence again. And so we're confronted with two different worldviews, one of the secular humanist and the other of the Christian theist, the Christian theist. Both are based on reason. They're both based on logic. But each are birthed from competing presuppositions. And you and I, we're, we're left with a choice to make. Which worldview are you going to base your life upon? Which presupposition is going to shape the way you live your life? So let's walk through Pinker's statement together this morning. Uh, Is God a delusion? If we're honest, Somewhere along the line, you've asked that question to yourself. Is there really, is there really a God? And there's a number of ways we can uh, try to answer that question. Uh, When asked about those who hold views similar to Pinker, Washington Post columnist Charles Krauthammer responded, I believe atheism is the least plausible of all theologies. It is clearly so contrary to what is possible. The idea that all this universe always existed, that it created itself, I mean, talk about the violation of human rationality. The Apostle Paul argues the same way from uh, Romans chapter 1, 19 to 20. He says, for what can be known about God is plain because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that men are without excuse. Uh, C.S. Lewis takes a little different approach in mere Christianity. He makes an argument for God from the the similarities in moral code and uh, in conduct across cultures. Uh, He says, human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way and, and cannot really seem to get rid of it. And so he argues this universal sense of morality is evidence of God. Uh, It's a God-based imprimatur upon the soul of humanity. So there's different ways that we could argue about, uh, make argumentations that bolsters our presupposition that indeed God exists, that he's not a delusion. But I think the strongest argument for us concerning the existence of God Uh, in contrary to to Pinker's position, is the person of Jesus Christ. In Scripture, we read of the testimony of four writers who collated firsthand eyewitness testimony of a person who performed acts beyond human capability. The sight of people uh, who could not see was restored. Those who couldn't walk all of a sudden by his word was were standing up and walking and jumping and leaping. Uh, Those who were disease ridden by his touch, uh, it was cleared out of their body. 
they were healed. People who died were revivified. And every one of those acts, Jesus attributed to a living God. But even more, I, I would say it's, it's the resurrection of Christ that ends up being our strongest argument for the existence of God. Typically at Easter, we talk about the resurrection as, you know, um, helping us to, to, to know that, well, if Christ was raised from the dead, we'll be raised from the dead as well, uh, giving us confidence to face death or uh, confidence that our sins are forgiven. If he was raised from the dead, we know that our sins are forgiven. And, and all that is theologically sound uh, and, and worth preaching about. But in response to Pinkert's kind of claim, I, I, I would say the resurrection proves to us that the testimony about the living God and his plan of redemption, it's all true. Start to finish. From Genesis to Revelation. It, it's interesting when you look at uh, Paul, he, he goes to the uh, 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 country of Athens, uh, uh, of um, he goes to the city of Athens, and he goes to this place called Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, and he, he preaches a message to them, to a people who have no idea about the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and he, he starts by making an argument that there is a living God who has created all things and that we stand in judgment of him, that, that he stands in judgment over all all peoples. And what is the single piece of evidence that he puts forth to convince this crowd that what he speaks is true? He says in Acts 17, 31, he has given proof of this to everyone by raising Jesus from the dead. It's the resurrection that Paul points to to say it's true. There is a living God. 1 Corinthians 15, another Greek uh, city, uh, as Paul writes to them, he says, For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if Christ has not been raised, we are found to be false witnesses about God. And your faith is futile. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people, most to be pitied. And you, you got to appreciate Paul's uh, intellectual honesty. In essence, Paul agrees with Stephen Pinker. Look, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, what Christians proclaim about God is a delusion, and those who uh, believe such false claims should be pitied. But... The reverse logic has to be true, too, that if Christ has been raised from the dead, then what we proclaim about God is true. And so Paul goes on in that chapter, uh, doubling down on the truth claim about the resurrection, telling us of Peter's interaction with the risen Christ and the other uh, apostles interaction with the risen Christ and then he goes on to say 500 other people testified to seeing him and then to that we add the multiple accounts we read in the gospels themselves about Jesus' resurrection Paul reports that his own life was transformed by an authentic interaction with the living and resurrected Christ you see the truth claims and wisdom, which lays behind every one of the parables, this parable today, throughout everything that Matthew writes and Mark writes and Luke writes and John writes, it all rests on the resurrection. All four Gospels culminate in the account of the resurrection. It's a punctuation point of the reality of the living God, the truth of the gospel, the corrective lenses of the Christian worldview. God is not dead. He is not a delusion, nor is belief in him unreasonable. And we know this 
because Christ has been risen from the dead. What then shall we make of Pinker's claim that belief in the afterlife is a malignant delusion because it devalues actual lives? It's kind of difficult to even know where to start with that statement. Uh, if indeed there is a living and just and loving God in whose image we have been made, then from what greater source could value and worth flow? And if for the love of those in this world, the living God set out to redeem us as objects of his mercy, going so far as to die a death on the cross, how can such love but testify to the value the living God has for you and for me? And if we're given the right to be called children of the living God through Christ's work, what other family possesses such regal status or royal blood pulsing through our veins, our spiritual veins, than those who trust in Christ. And if the living God promises to avenge all atrocities committed against us in a future day uh, to come, how can we deny that we are but held in the highest esteem in the courts of heaven above How can anyone argue that the belief in eternal life, uh, that the living God who, uh, who promises it to us, how, how does that devalue life? It, uh, does, it, it, no, it, it infuses meaning and purpose and value into every aspect of our lives. And no wonder Jesus, through this parable, encourages such positive uh, optimism, optimism uh, in anticipation of his return. The master's coming home. You can bank on it. Keep your lamps burning. Don't give up hope as if it was not true. How blessed you are. How valuable you are to him because he's coming for you. And to where does the secular humanist turn for value? I mean, what, where is value in his worldview? He argues that there's no difference between a cockroach and a child beyond, well, maybe longer appendages and a bigger brain. But to be fair to Pinker, his argument is that there is no God and therefore there's no afterlife. And if there's no afterlife in your focusing attention, people's attention on this afterlife, then you're focusing their attention away from right now and caring for people right now, this time that actually has value. And that's what he means, uh, that the belief in the afterlife devalues actual lives. And that leads to his third point, that the delusion of an afterlife discourages action that would make lives longer and safer and happier. And here we have to disagree with Pinker as well. C.S. Lewis once said, those who did most for the present world were those who thought most of the next. Throughout our parable today, Jesus speaks of servants who are put in charge of a household while the master is away. Everything has been entrusted to them and they're to ensure that the household is cared for in a manner that's worthy in keeping with the expectations and the character of the owner until he returns. And they're to do it with diligence. They're to be relentless without rest, staying awake, dressed for action, keeping the light shining throughout the house. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. 
Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Being awake doesn't mean daydreaming about the future or sitting on your hands on your bed, looking out your window for Christ to return on the clouds above, but being awake uh, and being dressed for action and having burning lamps in this parable, they all are talking about good deeds and acts of service, doing everything you can to prepare the house for the master's return, filling the house with the light of good deeds, which reflect the tenor of the good Lord for whom and upon whom we wait. Our future hope and expectation of Christ catalyzes us into focused action now. And so a few verses above, Jesus says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Because you see, when, when Christians place their trust in the promises of God, we no longer have to be concerned about our own welfare. As we said a few weeks ago, we, we know that God has our back, that he's protecting us and providing us now and through eternity. So what does that free us up to do? Well, it frees us up to stop worrying about ourselves and to take care of others, to bless them, to, to bring hope and joy and 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 care to their lives. Uh, we can do it with reckless abandonment, not worried about ourselves. But those who do not rest in the promises of God, well, as we said earlier, they, they, they only can rest upon themselves. Uh, they can only look after themselves. Uh, their attention is focused on the, their own provision and protection. So tell me, who is better positioned to make the lives of others more blessed. An observation bears this out. Who, who founded Yale? Who founded Harvard? Who founded Princeton? They were founded by Christian ministers, people of faith who desired to educate the population. What, uh, who is it that shaped the Declaration of Independence and and the constitution of our great nation. People who believed in the providence of God. Where did the Red Cross come from? Or the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association. Where'd that come from? How many uh, people have been blessed by the Salvation Army or Hope International, uh, Compassion International, International Justice Missions, World Relief, uh, Sam's, uh, Samaritan's Purse, World Vision, the Durham Rescue Mission, the Food Bank of Inglesa Emanuel, and on and on. Why have so many of you gone to Haiti uh, to, to serve uh, or kids in orphanages and, and, and in medical missions in Haiti? Why have some of you gone with Jeff to East Africa to out in the bush to provide a school and and provide water for those who don't have any with Staff of Hope. Show me the schools and the orphanages and hospitals that have been established in the name of atheism. And I'll turn uh, and show you thousands and thousands of institutions, 10,000 points of light established among the tribes and the peoples and the nations of this earth dedicated not to the glory of man, not to the reason of men, but to the glory of God to reflect his love for those in need throughout the earth to make their lives safer and longer and happier. Stephen Pinker says, belief in an afterlife is a malignant delusion since it devalues actual lives and discourages actions that would make them longer, safer, and happier. And Jesus says, your father is pleased to give you his kingdom. Do not be anxious about tomorrow what you will eat or drink, but seek first his kingdom and all these other things will be added 
to you. Sell your possessions. Give to the poor. Let your light shine so that people may be blessed by your good deeds and give glory and praise to God and work diligently to the end in anticipation of my return. Pinker's worldview is based on the presupposition that there is no God. Jesus' worldview is based on the presupposition that there is a God. And either Pinker is right or Jesus is right. And we need to choose sides. And we need to orient our lives around that right presupposition. Because that's where our life will flow from. The once skeptic, now Christian apologist Lee Strobel tweeted out in 2017, he said, to continue in atheism, I would have needed to believe that nothing produces everything, that non-life produces life, that randomness produces fine-tuning, that chaos produces information, that unconsciousness produces consciousness and non-reason produces reason. I simply didn't have that much faith, Lee said. And I'm with Lee, and I'm with Jesus, and I hope you are as well. And if you are, let's get ready. And let's get set, and let's serve, and let's pray. Lord, we do ask that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see that which is true. That we stand in the presence of a living God who has brought about salvation the, re the resurrection of his son and has called us into an authentic relationship with you. Lord, help us then to serve others with reckless abandonment that their lives may be longer and safer and happier. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, let's stand and continue to worship the living God through our closing hymn this day.
has come to make our lives uh, longer, safer, and happier. Uh, and he's entrusted to us this good news to take it from here and share it in the lives of people that are dear to you over Thanksgiving meals, uh, over conversations at work and at other places. So don't sit in your hands waiting for his return. Uh, make this household, uh, this world that he has given us to care for a better place. Be at peace knowing that, boy, he has provided everything for you. You can rest and you can give yourselves to other, to, to be transforming a transformational people for the sake of this world. Now receive the benediction to the one who indeed has come to make our lives longer and happier and safer. To the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit be all glory and majesty and dominion and power now and forevermore, go in his peace.